Good morning, everyone. My name's Wes, and I want to welcome you to our online worship gathering here this morning, especially if it's your first time joining us. Thanks for being a part of our Sunday gathering together. I want to let you know about our connection card. It's available online at crossbridgechristian.com slash connect. Stop by there, let us know you're here, and if there's a way we can pray for you, we'd love to stay in touch. Today is going to be a little bit different than probably what many of you are used to when we gather together. Normally when we get together, we sing a few songs of praise and thanks to God. I'll pop on and, and share a message from God's Word, and we'll do some of those things today, but it's going to be a little bit different. Because instead of singing together this morning, we're actually going to take time today to pray together as a congregation this morning. And specifically, we're going to pray because of something that we're going to read in the main passage that I want us to talk about together later on today. It comes from the book of Acts. Acts is a history of the first century church recorded for us by a guy named Luke, who was uh, one of the guys who also wrote a biography of Jesus' life and his teaching. And today we're going to focus on these two passages that Luke writes that characterize the early church in the first century. He says uh, in Acts chapter 2, they, the early church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at all the many signs uh, performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And then a couple of chapters later, Luke gives us another similar summary statement about the first century church. And he says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. The reason we're praying through these two particular passages today is because prayer is so closely linked to the idea of us getting it right when it comes to the idea of being a community defined by love, defined by helpfulness, and defined by generosity. Prayer was an integral part of this. Acts 2.42 already told you about that, that one of the things we're told that the first century Christians devoted themselves to was prayer. We didn't read this in Acts chapter 4, but immediately preceding the little summary statement I read you, Peter and John, two of the leaders of the first century church, were thrown into prison for a night, basically as a threat against them by the religious leaders to try and say, hey, you better shut up on this Jesus stuff because more of this is coming if you don't. And so when they were released from prison, Peter and John went to the church, and immediately the church did this. We're told by Luke in Acts 4.24, just a couple verses before that statement. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And then Luke records our prayer and records what happened at the end. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. In other words, prayer in Acts chapter 2 and prayer in Acts chapter 4 were the things that preceded and apparently were the lifeblood of the church being this kind of life-giving, helpful, loving, generous sort of community. And if that was the case for the first century church, it should be the case for us together as well today. And so here's how this is going to work. We're going to spend about 20 or 25 minutes in prayer together this morning. Certainly, you can pray about whatever you want. I'm not here to try and stop you. Uh, but we are actually going to have prompts and, and some ideas for what you can pray about on the screen accompanied by Scripture. And we hope that's helpful to you. You'll get about three minutes with each of these prompts. If you want to pray on your own, that's great. If you have someone with you or people with you and you want to pray together with them, also great. When there's about 15 seconds or so left, 
you're going to see the color of the words on the screen change as a sign to sort of wrap things up because the next prompt is going to be coming. We're going to end this prayer time together to, today by taking communion. And so uh, if you want to, go ahead and get those elements ready so you're prepared when that time comes in a little bit. I recognize that for some of us doing this, this is going to be the longest amount of time in one sitting that you've ever prayed about anything. That's awesome, okay? Um, some of us may not feel the most eloquent. Some of us might feel a little over our depth. And I kind of think, hey, you know what? That's good. That means we're growing. That means we're stretching ourselves. That means we're trying to get to a new place with God. Don't feel pressure to talk this whole time, guys, okay? Uh, feel free to leave some space so that you can listen to God. Often when I pray to God, what I discover is that the thoughts and the stuff that God brings to mind in those moments of silence, um, assuming that they're, you know, in alignment with Scripture, right? They don't seem like something that's totally out of character with what God would say to me. That often, that's God's way of speaking to me. That's his way of delivering to me a prompt on something he wants me to know or to hear or to do. Uh, so pay attention to that during this time. Uh, I don't care whether you're a prayer veteran or you're a prayer rookie, okay? This is an opportunity for us to grow in this extraordinarily important discipline uh, that will empower us as followers of Jesus and as a church uh, to make a difference in this world. I cannot think of a better way for us to bring this series to a close than by praying for God to help us embody his heart together as a church. So with that said, uh, we're going to throw the prompts on the screen. Enjoy praying together.
I'm back. I hope you enjoyed your time praying together. I'm going to make a couple quick remarks about the passages we opened up with and hopefully offer some helpful comments on how we can get this right and become the kind of church that I think God desires for us to be together. Uh, let's read those passages again, starting with Acts chapter 2. Um, we're told in Acts chapter 2 by Luke that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And I just want to key in on that word, devoted. Okay, Devotion is not something that's a casual word. It's something that we use to talk about our passion and our deep desire for something. And prayer was among the things that this first century body of believers was devoted to, that they were all about. Um, sadly, I know often the same can't be said about me, and maybe you're in that same boat too. But that devotion was rewarded with this awe, this sense of power that came upon these people as a result. And then Luke continues on, and he says that all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need, okay? These guys were serious about being generous. They were serious about loving their neighbor, up to the point of being willing to liquidate their assets. We normally give out of what we already have, out of our excess, out of our margin, and that's a good thing for us to do. The early church gave uh, sometimes even to the point of them like selling stuff so that they could have something to give to people who were in need, okay? The first century church's attitude about possessions, which is very convicting to me, and I hope it's convicting to you too, is that I'm willing to lose it if it means you can use it. I'm willing to lose it if it means that you can use it, okay? A couple of years ago, my favorite communicator is a guy named Andy Stanley. I heard him talk about kind of the attitude followers of Jesus should have around our possessions. And he, he shared this really practical guardrail. He says, you know what? I've made the decision that I'm never going to own something that I don't feel comfortable loaning out to someone else. Because the minute I start to feel that way, I'm in a dangerous place with my heart toward my possessions. I think what he was saying was, in effect, hey, when I'm not ready to give something away, I'm not in the position of the first century church. I'm not in a place where I'm able to say, hey, I'm willing to lose it if you can use it, okay? And that's this beautiful idea that surrounds how we think about our resources, our finances, and our possessions. But uh, Luke continues on. He tells us that every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They praised God and enjoyed the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Here's what I don't want you to miss, guys. The first century church, being this kind of generous, helpful, and loving community, was directly connected to them experiencing and seeing and knowing the blessing of God. It was through there being this kind of community, we're told, number one, by Luke, that the, the people around them, which isn't the church people, not the other Christians, Luke means all the people, like just regular citizens of Jerusalem, regular people who are around the temple, who are, who are in the city, that, that they looked upon the Christians favorably. Okay, some of you watching this today or listening to this today, you may not be followers of Jesus. And I'll bet if I were able to sit down with you and say, hey, give me a couple adjectives that you think describe Christians. Okay, if you're bold enough, I guess you could you know, share them on the, on the comments below or something. Uh, but my guess is whatever words you came up with, they probably wouldn't be loving, helpful, and generous, sadly. Um, because sadly, Christians, we in America, have not always portrayed ourselves that way. And in fact, much to our shame, the words that you might use to describe us might be, in fact, stingy or mean or cold-hearted or callous, right? Um, not helpful, <laughs> okay? That, that sadly, we are not known for being this kind of community. And because we aren't known as that kind of community, we don't receive the favor of people. But more importantly, I think because we're not that kind of community, we don't receive the favor of God. Because we're told in this passage is a direct connection to the kind of community that the first century Christians strove to become, that God added to their number daily the amount of people being saved, the amount of people being connected to him. Uh, as a church, as a pastor of a church, with a stated mission to help disconnected people connect to God, 
That's a really big deal to me, guys. We should pay attention any time in the Bible that phrase comes up about, and God connected people to God as a result, right? We should take note, and we should note specifically this big idea that God generously blesses a generous church. That God loves to bless churches that are marked by love, by generosity, by sharing, by trying to be helpful to the world around them. God generously blesses a generous church. This is the case in the other passage from Luke uh, that we read as well in Acts chapter 4. He says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. Again, I'm willing to lose it if it means that you can use it. Everyone saw their property, their possessions, their resources, not as theirs, but as God's. And they understood that whatever they held in their hands was given to them by God so they could use it to accelerate his kingdom and push forward his kingdom purposes. And Luke continues on writing that with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. A supernatural power empowered them to be able to do this. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, there were no needy persons among them. That's an incredible statement. For from time to time, those who owned lands or land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Again, God generously blesses a generous church. One of the things that stood out to me in this passage was specifically the idea that a couple of the commentators I read wrote about, which is their connection of God's blessing and this church community being this particular kind of church community that was so helpful, that was so generous, that was so loving. Right? They took very seriously the call from Jesus to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And as a result, this isn't me, this is people way smarter than me wrote, um, Luke is trying to draw a direct connection for us between God's supernatural grace and power and the generosity of the first century church, uh, of them getting this right, okay? Because God loves to generously bless a generous church. I have a couple ideas on how we, as God's church, can get this right. But before I even share those, I want you to think about uh, just, can you imagine the power of a church like this in Tallahassee, a church this generous, a church this helpful, a church this loving and this serious about caring for the world around us. Folks, we live in an unprecedented world marked by COVID, okay? Like people are out of work in big numbers. We're seeing reduction in hours. All the gains that have been made in the job market over the past several years were wiped out in a matter of just a couple of weeks uh, this spring when all of this started happening. There's unprecedented need all around our world and our community is not an exception. In our city, we have pockets of communities on the south and the west side specifically where poverty is a huge, huge issue, where there is lots of opportunity for us as a church to step in, to be for Tallahassee and to be generous, okay? Sadly, uh, many people don't think of the church as a generous, helpful, loving community. Um, for better or for worse, the bar is incredibly low for us to enter in and to be a part of making our world a better place in the name of Jesus. Guys, I don't think it takes a lot of imagination for us to imagine the power of a community that says, we want to get this right. We want to make a difference. We want to unleash the love of Jesus in a generous, helpful way on our world. There is true possibility here. And so here are a couple of suggestions from me on how I think we can get this right. One way we can get this right is by committing ourselves to prayer. Um, it's the very first thing that Luke writes in Acts 2.42. They were devoted to prayer. And sadly, when I think about my commitment to prayer, I don't think it's quite so devoted. I don't think it's quite so passionate. And uh, I don't really like saying this out loud, but if I'm really honest, a lot of times I kind of find myself thinking, I don't really know if my prayers are making that big of a difference. Nothing could be more out of alignment with the will and the heart and the knowledge of Jesus. Um, when I talk about prayer, I'm not talking about prayer like before your meal or when you go to bed, you know, or God, be with this person. God, thank you for this day, whatever. Okay, that's good. That's fine. Okay. I'm talking about 
prayer, right? Prayer that storms the kingdom of heaven and says, God, I want to rip your kingdom down from heaven here into our sphere, here into this earth. God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, here it is in heaven. God, sign me up, send me where you want to go. God, I am praying for a movement of the spirit in an unprecedented way in the world around me, okay? Jesus, when he talked about prayer one time, he told a series of stories to illustrate that when we keep bombarding heaven's door with prayer, God listens, God hears, and God grants our request. He told a story about a woman bringing her case before an unjust judge. Our friend Marco Waters shared about that earlier this summer. And what does Jesus say? Man, if this woman in her persistence is able to wear down an unrighteous judge, how much more so do you think your perfectly righteous and loving Heavenly Father is going to listen when his kids call to him? Jesus told another story about a guy who has an unexpected guest late at night and has nothing to serve them. And so he goes next door to his neighbor and he pounds on the door. You know, and the guy says, shut up, go away, leave me alone. You know, everyone's tucked in the bed. I don't want to come and help you out, right? And he just keeps pounding on the door. And finally, his neighbor comes to the door with a loaf of bread. Uh, it's a result of his persistence. And Jesus basically makes the point, how much more so do you think your father in heaven wants to help people who are persistent in their asking of him? Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open, right? That sounds like a pretty amazing promise about prayer. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews tells us that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. Guys, the message is clear. God hears when we pray and our prayers have the power to bring heaven into earth, okay? We should not grow weak. We should not grow uh, short-sighted. We should not grow weary in our prayers. When we are devoted to prayer, we can be the kind of community that gets this right. Secondly, we get this right when we put feet to our faith, okay? Here in America, for whatever reason, we are content to have a Christianity that only lives in here and not out here. We like the idea of being a fan of Jesus. We like the idea of having this nice spiritual system that makes us feel good and makes us, you know, hopefully we think go to heaven when we die and all that kind of stuff, right? But we don't get too carried away when it comes to actually boldly living our faith out in the world. That might pass muster for American Christianity. That does not pass muster for Jesus's Christianity, Okay. A guy named Jeff Brody says this, love is just talk until you sacrifice. Love is the highest calling of the Christian faith. When Jesus surrounded his disciples for their final meal together, he said, guys, I'm giving you a new command and it's to love other people in the same way I have loved you. Okay, Love was an extraordinarily important thing to Jesus. It was extraordinarily important to his followers. And they saw their love not just as something they could feel good about feeling on the inside. They saw love as something that had to be tangibly demonstrated on the outside. When the Bible speaks about love, it doesn't speak about it as some nice little feeling. It speaks about it as a verb. It speaks about it as a feeling that shows itself and that pours forth into our actions. We as a community, we, we get this right when we allow our love not just to live in here, but to show itself out here in the way that we're helpful and in the way that we are specifically following the example of the early church, generous to those who might have need. A third way we get this right. We get this right when we err on the side of generosity. I want to read to you these words from Jesus in Luke chapter 6. Jesus says, give, and it will be given to you. Oh, I, I get something, Jesus, I'm kind of interested. And then he continues on. He says, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. And then here's the key phrase I want us to lock in on. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And what Jesus says, in effect, the same thing that Paul keyed off on in our passage we read last week from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Hey, if you sow generously, you receive back generously. <laughs> if you sow sparingly, you receive sparingly, right? The measure we use is how it will be measured back to us. And what Jesus, I think, is encouraging us as his followers to do is to take him at his word and to be generous in the way that we give, to err on the side of generosity in all that we do, okay? 
we're doing this uh, Operation Oak Ridge thing. And when this first started, I, uh, Brittany stepped up in our family to say, hey, you know what? Um, I'll be the one that kind of takes the lead on this. You know, I'll go to the store and grab stuff. And man, she's been awesome and diligent. I'm so proud of her. Every day when she comes home from work, she'll stop off at Publix or Target or Walmart or wherever and pick up some disinfectant wipes or some spray or whatever she can find and get her hands on and uh, bring it back home. I want to show you a picture of all that she hauled in over the course of just one week. Okay, this is our guest bedroom that I'm going to show you on the screen here. I kid you not, with the exception of maybe three items I picked up the first day we did this and two or three items someone gave us because they were going to be out of town when we were turning this stuff in, all of that was my wife. Like, I am so proud of her. Now, I have a confession I need to make. I'm the bookkeeper in our family. I'm the one that pays the bills and kind of keeps a tab on what's coming in, what's going out, you know, does the budget, all that kind of stuff. And I hate to admit this, but on more than one occasion, I've kind of found myself thinking, honey, I'm really glad you took the green light, but I I, I wasn't thinking it was going to be that green of a light. You know, um, man, we have other people at Crossbridge too. You know, save some for them. Maybe they could get some stuff too, you know? And every time I find myself thinking about that, I come back to the echo of Jesus' words in these verses that, that, that man, with the measure we use, it will be measured back to us. I find myself continuing to think, now, Wes, and the way of the kingdom is not to be stingy. The way of the kingdom is not to be tight-fisted with my resources that God has entrusted to me. The way of the kingdom is to be generous. It's to sow seed. It's to err on the side of being liberal with what we give as opposed to being pretty conservative. Because we serve a God who is great, who is big, who is expansive, and can do more than all we ask or imagine. God created the world and the universe that we are still exploring and trying to figure out, guys. Surely he can create the resources that I need as a result of giving generously. We can get this right when we err on the side of generosity. God loves to bless a generous church. Crossbridge, we have the power and the opportunity in front of us to get this right. We have the power and the opportunity to be a community that unleashes the love of God on the city in desperate need of it. We have an opportunity, I think, to rewrite the narrative on what people think Christians are, right? We're not some voting block. We're not some group of obstinate people. We are a group of people trying to passionately follow Jesus and see the kingdom of love that Jesus brought advanced forward into this world. Guys, when we get this right, when we commit ourselves to prayer, when we commit ourselves to putting feet to our faith, to getting out of our seat and into the street, when we commit ourselves to erring on the side of generosity, we take a step toward becoming the kind of community that in Acts 2 and Acts 4, we see God generously blessing. He did it once, he's done it since, and I am confident he wants to do it again. He's just asking for you and I to be the kind of people and the kind of community that he can bless. Let's pray for him to do that. Lord, I ask and pray that you would shape us in the community that gets this right. Help us, God, to use our resources, our finances, our, our all of our material things, God, in a way that honors you. Help us be radically generous and loving. Help us be incredibly helpful to the community and to the people that surround us, Lord. God, send us out. May this not just be some series of messages that was nice to have and then we forget. God, may this be a defining way in which we live our lives. God, that we are committed to being people who live with radical generosity toward the people whom you love and care about most. Lord, we thank you that you were radically generous in the gift of your son to us. Help us to follow his example and how we are generous to others. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As we wrap up, I want to share with you a couple highlights and announcements about stuff going on here at our church. Um, we have the connection card, again, available at crossbridgechristian.com slash connect. We'd love for you to fill that out. Let us know you're here. Uh, for all of you filling that out for the first time, we'll actually send a $10 donation to help people uh, working through the economic impacts of COVID. Uh, secondly, a reminder, today is the final day for your Operation Oak Ridge drop-off. We've got the address where you can do that below. Thanks to Alex and Melissa for being a part of that. Just leave it right there with them. 
and uh, we'll be, have a chance to bless our teachers in the upcoming week ahead. I want to let you know that next weekend we're going to start a new series of messages I'm really excited about. It's called Taking Responsibility. Uh, it's going to be a really important conversation about how our actions affect other people. And I think it's something that is a good reminder for all of us. And I think especially in the culture in which we live, this is a needed and necessary reminder. And I, I think you'll be very, very glad that you participate in it with us. I want you to invite a friend or friends to come and be a part of this with you. You can do that in a page that we've created online at crossbridgechristian.com slash invite. It'll give you information on the series. It'll give them information about where and how they can join. They'll have the watch website on there uh, that they can go to. We've also created, uh, for those of you who are enterprising, maybe you're interested in hosting a few people in your home to watch together, uh, we've actually uh, created a page on our website as well uh, with some information on how you can host a little watch party on Sunday mornings. And so if you're interested in learning about how to do that uh, with a couple of people in your home, uh, go ahead and just head to crossbridgechristian.com slash watch party. And we'll have all of that online there as well. Check out our social media feeds. It's uh, just at Crossbridge TLH on Instagram, on Facebook. And uh, you can share stuff on there as well. We'd rather invite people that way. Lastly, uh, I want to remind you to give. And you can do that online at crossbridgechristian.com slash give by texting an amount to 84321 uh, or by sending a gift to the address on the screen right here. I am really, really thankful for your generosity. It has equipped us to be generous as a church uh, toward people in our need in our community in a pretty unprecedented way for us during this time. And uh, I'm pretty excited and pumped about that. So thank you so much uh, for entrusting your resources to us. I can assure you every single dollar that comes our way is being used to help people, uh, disconnected people connect to God. Thank you so much for joining us this week, guys. We'll catch you again next weekend right here online at crossbridgechristian.com slash watch. Have an excellent Sunday.